the title of today's uh, webinar is Using Blast Well, and uh, I'm pleased to, to present Tom Madden, who's the lead of our Blast uh, team here at NCBI. And I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. So <clears throat> this is Tom Madden. And so let me get just give you a little, little bit of background on this webinar. Is I had originally um, written up this as a talk for a hackathon that we had here at the um, NIH about a month ago. And so it was well received, and then we had some other ideas, so we modified it a bit, and we're using it for the webinar. Since it was for a hackathon, it was actually kind of centered around, um, targeted to um, standalone Blast Plus users. Um, and so that's as opposed to people who come to the web page to run Blast. Um, but if you've never run standalone Blast, let me let me first say what that is. That basically means that you download our executables from the FTP site or somebody's installed on your machine and you go to a command line and you type something to run them. And I'll, I'll have some examples of that later on. Um, if you've never done that, you may still find this interesting because I'm going to talk about the um, some of the BLAST databases and what they contain. Um, anyway, so I let me get going and hopefully you'll find this interesting. So this is the um, kind of the first, what I call the boilerplate slide that, you know, what is BLAST? I assume that most people are familiar with, you know, at least the basics of what BLAST is supposed to do. Um, the main idea is it calculates similarity between, you know, for biological sequences and you get your query and you scan a database and look for similar sequences. Um, and then you can decide whether or not those similar sequences are actually homologous. Um, it's pretty fast. It uses statistical theory to help you determine if a match might have occurred by chance. Um, so first I'm going to turn and talk about the different databases we have. Um, our database descriptions can actually be kind of confusing. And this is something that we actually need to work on is in maybe having doing doing a better job of this. But there are two main databases like we look at that people often use, and one is the non-redundant protein database called NR, and this is basically our largest collection of proteins, and it gives you proteins from like GenBank CDSs and PDB and SwissPro and everything, though it excludes environmental samples from WGS, and we, it also excludes patent sequences. Um, and those are actually searchable separately in separate databases. And the other um, database that a lot of people search is the nucleotide and T1. And that's got a collection of a lot of different nucleotide sequences. Um, you know, it does exclude some of these like ESTs and STS and GSS um, and a whole bunch of other sequences that also excludes all these assembled genomes like the human genome and mouse genome. And that's actually something that you can search separately. And so that's it's important to really realize what it's, what's in these databases um, as you go looking at them. So as I said, it can be kind of confusing. And so one one way to look at this is with a Venn diagram. And I'm thinking, you know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, uh, you know, a Venn diagram is worth ten thousand. And um, so what we have is is we have the in this on the left here. Um, and Peter, can can they see my mouse here or a pointer? Okay, so um, I guess you can see my mouse. So this left large circle here is the NR non-redundant database, and inside of non-NR, it ex includes a few other databases. And there's the RefSeq protein, which is just um, sequences that have been annotated here at the NCBI have better annotation, um, and they've been a little bit more validation has been done on them. Also included are the SwissPro sequences. And so if you're probably familiar with SwissPro, it's a smaller database, but those are actually very well curated. And um, inside of RefSeq Protein is also the Landmark database, which is a um, which we use for Smart Blast. And that's a set of um, proteomes from, I think it's 26 different um, organisms. And so that kind of gives you a very non-redundant um, spread out set. And then, on top of that is PDB, um, and those are those are sequences um, with associated PDB structures. Um, and, and so these are the sizes are all not really to scale. They just kind of give you an idea of what things are. Is like, for example, RefSeq is about half of NR, so it's actually pretty large. 
and I just kind of drew this here at Swiss Pro. Probably a lot of the sequences in Swiss Pro do overlap with RefSeq, and, and maybe they overlap my more like 100%. I'm not sure. I do know that Landmark is completely enclosed within RefSeq. Um, the other independent databases are there's a database of metagenomic proteins, um, and this basically a lot of these come from WGS, the transcriptome shotgun assembly proteins, and patent. So, um, oh, actually, before I move on here, let's just say that NR, so that this big NR, has 171 million sequences and 63 billion residues. That's billion with a B. So that's actually pretty large. RefSeq is um, 118 million sequences and 63, I'm sorry, 45 billion residues. So actually, RefSeq is a substantial fraction of NR. Um, Swiss Pro has um, 470,000 sequences and 178 million residues. And landmark, as it show, as they show you here, is pretty pretty small. So, so one question is, is why do I search these? And you can think of this as like a use case. Why would people want to run a search against NR as opposed to RefSeq protein or landmark? Um, you know, and, and so the way you think about NR, the non-redundant one, is it's almost all the proteins at the NCBI, and you might be looking for homologs and other organisms. You got a protein, you're going to look for homologs and other organisms, or maybe you just want to identify your protein. I, I don't know what this protein is. I'm going to search it against at the NCBI. Um, RefSeq protein, so it's basically the same task, except you've got um, well curated proteins in RefSeq. So there you might again search for homologs and other organisms, and you might just identify a protein. On the other hand, Landmark has only got 26, I think it's 23 or 26 different organisms spread across a, a great taxonomic range. And so what that will allow you to do is kind of find homologs and distantly related model organisms that represent you know, a wide range of taxonomic groups. So these are not necessarily all the use cases that you could have for a database. Um, and if you're not doing exactly this, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. And if you'd like to actually share in the, the box what kind of use cases that you have for protein databases or, or the nucleotide databases, and we have time, we could actually go through a few of those. And that might be interesting for other people um, listening to this to hear what, how people are using these databases. Um, might be interesting for me, too. Um, and it says at the bottom here, it's not an exhaustive list. So moving on to the nucleotide databases, there's actually, um, it, it's a, uh, a lot, lot more confusing in a way. So here you have the nucleotide, which we talk, I talked about earlier. And so this is about 48 million sequences in 200 billion bases. So that's um, substantial. And inside of it is then the RefSeq RNA. And that's 23 million sequences in 57 billion bases. So that's about a third or so the size of NT. And the um, and then we have the smaller 16S ribosomal um, sequences. And, and so I'm going to come back and tell you a little, a little bit more about what these are for. But the 16S is um, well curated sequences that you can actually use to, uh, like, for example, you know, verify or classify taxonomy of your sequences. So we have this group over here on the left. And then over here, we have this massive set which is RefSeq genomes, and this is basically all the genomes um, that are in RefSeq at the NCBI, and that's going to include uh, most of the eukaryotic genomes, you know, human genome, mouse genome, and I, I just put down here many other genomes, but that's also going to have like some, you know, alligator genome, crocodile genome, um, and so and the re and so this this ends up being a very large set. Um, within a set of RefSeq genomes, we have what we call representative genomes, and that gives you just um, rather than giving you redundant sets of genomes, it gives you the one best genome that we think is representative. And so that would mean that rather than having like three copies of the human genome, and there's probably more than that now, is that you just have the one within the representative genomes. Um, outside of this is then the um, other things like um, 
express sequence tags, ESTs, patent. Again, we, we've separated patent out again, um, just because most, and, and actually the, the rationale for that is, is that most scientists aren't really that interested in seeing the patent records because they're not really, they, they don't have a lot of scientific information on them. Um, and if you're really interested in patents, um, then you're probably not going to be interested in all the um, all these other sequences over here. And so, and there's also some older sets of databases like high throughput genomic sequences, phases zero, one, and two. Um, these were really popular about 20 years ago um, when the human genome was being assembled. Um, and since then, it's um, you don't get a lot of additions to HTGS or EST anymore. So then they're, they're not. My thing is they're not really that interesting because they're not going to have the newest, greatest sequences in them. And then on top of that, we also have the blast through the web page and also through, through some standalone executables offers you the whole genome sequences. And I can't even tell you how large that is. It's very large, as well as SRA, which is the NCBI sequence read archive. And, and so at least for, I know for SRA, they, they measure this and they talk about um, petabytes and petabases and WGS is also um, not small. So again, let's look at some of the use cases for nucleotide databases. And what we see people doing with NT, this is largest nucleotide databases. You know, maybe they're gonna verify the identity of some DNA, that meaning I've just sequenced something, I think I know what it is, and I just wanna verify it real quick. Um, I might have the case that I really need to identify the DNA. Um, and so I, I have some, you know, I've done some sequencing run. Um, I've got a lot of DNA and I just wanna run it and see what each of these um, sequences are part of. Um, so RefSeq RNA, um, as it says here, you know, as it implies, these are RNA, mRNAs and other RNAs. Um, and these are curated, provided by the RefSeq group at the NCBI. And for this, you could identify, for example, unknown mRNA transcripts. You could identify coding regions on genomic sequences. You could look for other you know, RNA types of um, sequence. The 16S database that I talked about, this, this ribosomal database, um, this is actually very useful because it allows you to classify the taxonomy of sequences and samples. And this data has actually been maintained here at the NCBI, so we're pretty sure of the taxonomy, um, and, and we, we think that's pretty reliable. Um, and it also allows you to validate the quality of the sequences, for example, look for misassemblies or contamination or such. And so finally, there's these other sequences that we talked about, like the, um, like for example, the human genome. You know, and so question might be is, is when do I use NT? When do I use the human genome? And for the human genome, this is going to be the case of well, I want to, I've got a gene, I want to find the gene on the specific genome here. Um, and that would be like the case of for BLASTN or TBLASTN. So BLASTN would take a nucleotide query and BLASTN is the human genome. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, TBLASTN doesn't apply here. That's that's wrong. Okay. And the other case is I might, you know, map reads to a genome with this new program we call Magic Blast is the splice aware aligner. And I'll, I'll mention that later on. Um, so as I mentioned um, before, NT is pretty large, about 200 billion bases. Um, RefSeq is about, um, RNA is about 57 billion bases. And the 16S is like 30 million bases. So the other two were Bs and 16S is, a, is an M. And the human genome, of course, is, um, stays at three billion bases. And I think I mentioned that the, if we go up here, just to be clear then, this RefSeq genome here is about 1.2 um, terabases, um, which I guess it's um, trillion bases, right? So that that's actually very large. So now I want to switch gears a little bit. I've kind of gone over some of the databases, and I'm going to switch to gears and talk about blast parameters. Um, and, and this is something that people have found confusing in the past, and will probably find confusing in the future. And so that, that's why I want to address it. Um, there are a large number of BLAST parameters. A lot of them have to do with some sort of algorithmic tuning. And most of those you can just leave alone. That they've kind of been tuned for a good, um, good default. And 
so I, I would not, most of those I would not change. Um, there's also on the standalone, there's this task um, parameter that you can set. And so by the task parameter targets your search to a specific use case. For example, dash task of blast n gives you a word size of 11 and a pretty sensitive search, whereas the dash task of mega blast invokes the greedy mega blast alignments and that has an initial word size of 28, meaning I need an exact match of 28 letters to do anything, and then uses a, a greedy method of extension. It's um, generally speaking, it's faster, um, and but less sensitive, but often it does the job. Um, on Blast P, there's a, you can do a task, a dash task of Blast P, which is kind of the standard Blast P search that was, um, that people have known about for, quite a while and, and first came out in 97. Um, and then there's also a blast P dash fast, which is still pretty sensitive, but uses a larger word size and um, a compressed alphabet to do the search actually faster. So, so those are kind of good, that, that's actually a good way to approach the problem is by setting the dash task flag. Um, there are other parameters I would encourage people to um, look at. For example, there's the expect value. And now if, if you're not familiar with an expect value, I'm just gonna say real quick um, what it is. And so generally, so expect value lower is better. Um, that means a, a lower expect value, it's kind of like a P value and the lower it is, um, <laughs> the, the better it is. Um, it's a, the default is, and so think of it as a false positive rate. And what it tells you is it's the number of hits equal to or greater than the score expected to arise by chance. Um, if that last sentence is a little bit um, long to remember, just think of lower is better, false positive rate. Um, and the default now is 10, which um, is, is actually a little bit high for most searches. And that just says that if you've got an expect value of 10, that you probably got 10 results um, in there that just arose by chance. And often you want to lower the expect value to 0 0.01 or 10 to the minus 5, or it might even be 10 to the minus 30th. It depends on really what you're going to do with the results. Um, if you want to make sure you get a lot of results and that you've got stuff to kind of comb through and look at and, and maybe think about what's in that people call the twilight zone where it's not really clear whether this is a real homolog or or just kind of a, some sort of artifact, then you know maybe you want to go to to 0 0.1 or 0 0.01. On the other hand, if you have a pipeline and you just want to make sure that these are really strong matches and you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of sequences, then you probably want a pretty low expect value to prevent you from getting um, you know false positives. And okay, so other parameters that you might want to look at things like the word size, um, and I had mentioned this before with um, in the task, is blast and the default is 11. And so that means that you need 11 bases that match exactly um, before you do anything with a, between two sequences. So the two sequences is have to have 11 bases matching exactly. And for mega blast, that's 28, which makes um, mega blast less sensitive, but on the other hand, the databases, as we talked about, are actually pretty big. So a mega blast search with 28, a lot of mRNAs, you'll probably get a, a fair number of hits and you may get all the information you ever need. If you're running the um, kind of getting out the standard blast report, you can change the number of descriptions or the number of alignments. Um, you can also change the the what we call max target seeks for like a tabular XML and JSON. And I'll, I'll be showing you examples of these formats in a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I want to kind of go back and, and talk about something that, you know, people have been discussing recently on Twitter and other places is that, so I've got my search here, right? And so I'm running blast in, and, and this is the default task for blast in is actually mega blast. I, I, so this is really a mega blast run, and I'm running against NT, these 200 billion bases. Um, I got my query, and it's um, part of an E. coli sequence. I set it a pretty low expect value, you know, 10 to the minus six, and I said, I just wanna see 
one match. Max target sequence is one. I, I want to see the first hit that Blast finds. And this is a way of getting tabular output. And so I can say out format, you know, so I want to see the query accession, the um, database accession, the start and the end of the um, database sequence expect value of the match bit score, scientific name and title. Um, and, and we got some documentation on this, and I'll go through some other examples of, of this out format here. But the main thing is, is that if you run it, you get one match. You've asked Blast to give you one match. So it gives you that. Um, and so the I, I had named this the query E. coli, and this is the accession of the database sequence. And um, so what do we got here? So and this just says that the match starts um, here. And so is that three point? Is that 3.9 million, I guess, and goes on to here. Um, and it has a, you know, expect value of uh, basically of zero, which means that it's, you know, I think means it's below 10 to the minus 180. It's very small, um, a large bit score. So it means it's high. Um, the organism is E. coli. And then the, um, the title here is isolate NQ3 chromosome complete genome. Okay, very good. So I put this in here. I've got one E. coli match. Um, I'm done. This is the only best result. But let's go back and look at this run down here. And I've done the same run, except rather than asking max target sequences one, I say max target sequences 10. So I want to see 10 matches. Um, so this gives me more to look at. Um, but maybe it's a little bit more revealing. Um, and it depends on what I want. And so I'm seeing I got my 10 matches. And the interesting thing here is, is that the, um, OK, that's the max target sequence one, and that's 10. And so the interesting thing here is I actually have five matches with the same score. So they're all equivalent. And really, there's no way to say that one is better than the other as far as BLAST is concerned. Now, these are all E. coli, so it's a, um, you know, and so maybe it doesn't make any difference to you, depending upon your use case. You say, well, yeah, this is E. coli, and I'm happy with that. Um, there there might be other examples where we could find where, like, maybe one of the E. coli strains is pathogenic, or maybe it actually matches exactly with some other bacteria. Um, so, so that's a question, is that by just looking at the first one, you're actually um, throwing away some of this information. And so here you see that there are basically different strains are listed here. And so you've lost that information by only looking at one. Now, of course, it depends upon what you're looking to do with this, whether you, whether you can be satisfied with just one, or maybe you want to go for a few and, and double check that. And so this, this is actually um, kind of the dangers of just looking at one match. So now, switching gears a little bit, I want to talk a, about kind of different kinds of reports that you can produce. Um, and so this, since this talk is geared towards um, standalone Blast Plus, I, I'm going to kind of go through different reports that are easier to parse and that people might find useful when they're running Blast, um, especially as part of a pipeline. Um, so the first one here is the standard Blast report. It's been around for a long time. This is actually the command line that produces this BLAST report. And so you see here BLAST N, the database is RESTSeq RNA. The query is U0001. You know, it's, I put it in FASTA here. And I'm just taking the first 40 lines here. If you're familiar with, with Unix or Linux, head just means give me the first 40 lines of the output. And so, OK, so we see a reference. We see the name of the database. We see the query and what the query is, the length of the query, and these different matches that are, you know, produce significant alignments, meaning statistically significant. Um, the bit scores over here, and there you see the E value. And you just notice that all these E values coming up are zero, just because there's a lot of different copies of this mRNA in the RESTSeq RNA database. So, and even though this is megablast, running in megablast mode here, there is absolutely no problem of finding lots of results. But so this report is designed to be human readable. Um, it's subject to change. Um, and so we do not encourage you to parse it. 
And that's actually why we produce some other formats that we are easier to parse and provide better support for that. Um, so one of the one that people actually like a lot is the so-called tabular report. And so here is the command line here that shows you how to um, to run this. And to produce this output, we use dash out format seven. And so it's going to give me the the default tabular report, which is you know the query and the subject and the percent identity and some other information you can look at. Um, the main thing being, you know, here you have the expect value that you saw on the um, the normal blast report. Here you have the bit scores, and it kind of gives you the the start and stop of the matches. So if you could actually go through and parse this and say, oh, well, my query matched these database sequences starting here to there, and that's um, and maybe I'm going to go pick this out and look at this some more, or okay. So this is simple to parse. It's nice. Now, it, this is not all the information people ever want out of um, BLAST. And so that's why we have, you can customize the tabular report. And so to do that, it's out format seven and query accession, subject accession length, which means the subject, the length of the alignment. And then this is the subject length. And so this is actually giving you pretty basic information it's not giving you the expect value it's not giving you the bit score um, and so you see here this is queer all the time um, these are the different database sequences um, and the, these are the, the lengths of the the database sequence oh I'm sorry these are the lengths of the alignment and then these are the lengths of the database sequences now for example you could write an aux script that would just parse this and take a um, you know, divide, you know, this length by that length and tell you, you know, how much of your subject sequence was actually covered by your query um, or how much of your subject sequence is actually covered by the alignment because maybe you want matches that cover most of the subject sequence. Um, something else you can do is you can go for taxonomy. And so this is the same thing here, query accession, subject accession, this, the scientific name, and then the common name. Um, and that's for the subject sequence in both cases. And so you see here, well, this is, you know, homo sapiens, human, human. This is, you know, pygmy chimpanzee, um, chimpanzee. And so this kind of goes down and gives you taxonomy information without telling you, you know, of course, you're not looking at expect value or bit score here. You could actually print those out here, but I just didn't bother to keep this simple. But so this gives you specialized taxonomy information. Uh, do the same thing, um, CSV, comma separated value, and then you should be able to um, upload that, pull it into Excel, or maybe parse it in some other way. Um, and, and so that gives you a lot of flexibility. Something else that people have liked has been the, the JSON. And, and what, so this is just a, um, it's kind of like, I think of this as a blast report in, in JSON. And so here, for example, here you see the reference up here. Um, you see some of the parameter information, uh, the query ID. If you go down here, then you're seeing the, the information about your first match, you know, the ID, um, the accession. Uh, 9606 is, means that it's human. And so the tax ID, um, the NCBI taxonomy group assigns the tax ID to every node in taxonomy tree. And for human, it's 9606. And that's just a convenient way of referring, you know, at least in programs, of referring back to a specific node in a taxonomy tree. And so this is actually giving you a lot of information here um, that you can, in an easily parsable um, way, for example, JSON, you probably run a Python script, load it in, and parse this out pretty quickly. Um, and basically, it, we have an XML format that is the same thing. Um, and then one comment is, is that, as you might know, we are, the NCBI is moving away from GIs and towards accessions. So I, I would suggest that you just stick with the accessions here rather than getting stuck on the GIs that may disappear from you. Okay, oh, and this is, sorry, this is output format 15, and this is the command line up here. So there's a, um, so I've showed you a bunch of different reports, 
and, and you could imagine they have different uses. For example, I run BLAST. Um, I want to get a tabular report. I just want to see, um, and I only want to look at matches that cover my query, you know, have a certain coverage over my query, or maybe um, have a certain taxonomy or, you know, a certain bit score. And then if they reach some threshold, maybe I want to go back and look at this manually. Um, other, otherwise, I'm just going to discard this or, you know. And so this this um, would almost indicate that you need to run BLAST multiple times, but that's actually not the case because BLAST has something you can run at once and then you can, you know, enjoy your results, so to speak, many times with the BLAST formatter. And so this is an example. This is the command line I would run for BLAST in, and this is the database refseq RNA, the query, out format 11, and it produces BLAST archive format. And then the BLAST formatter, which is a separate program, can read in this file here, and it can format it as requested. And for example, this is out format 7, the standard tabular format. Um, you could do this, you know, basically all the examples I showed you earlier. So you could, you know, run this one right here. And if you decide that these, um, the length of the alignment was long enough or overcame some threshold and thought that was really interesting to look at, then you could go down and you could um, just look at a, you could spit out a standard blast report. And so that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, shifting gear again, and hopefully I'm not doing too bad on time, but I want to talk a bit about taxonomic limits. Um, it can clear the clutter, um, meaning I get a lot of results and maybe I don't want to see them all. Maybe I only want to see the human results or maybe I don't want to see the human results. Um, maybe I only want to see bacterial results. Um, and it runs faster in general, at least, because the um, you've got less of a database to search. And so here's an example. I've got RefSeq protein. I've got this human um, protein here, and I'm searching against RefSeq protein. I've limited the human. And so I see then that all these, well, first of all, all these matches say human here, right? And you'll see that I've got different components, different isoforms. So I've got a lot of variety. Um, and so the, these two proteins are related, but I'm, I'm really getting all the different isoforms. And this is all the results I get. I get 12 results here. And so, th so that's actually great because I can look through those. And if I'm interested in the different isoforms, then now I, now I have that information. Now, if I do the same thing without a limit, um, you know, it's five, first of all, it's 507 hits. So you're not seeing all the hits here. Um, I'm seeing it from different organisms, um, you know, from gorilla and chimp and everything else. And what's different here also is really I only seem to be seeing one, one version of the protein, one isoform here. They all say component A2, component A2. Um, so this is actually a different use case. I've got one protein, one isoform. I want to see you know, how it appears in all kinds of different organisms. Um, maybe I want to make a tree with this. Maybe I want to find out if this, you know, this isoform, which organisms it appears in. So that's kind of a different use case. Um, so we re recently had some, made some enhancements to um, help people limit the search by taxonomy. And so we're calling this BlastDB version five. Um, you know, I apologize for the programmer speak, um, and the reason it's called version five is because the current version of the last database is version four. And But what it lets you do is limit your search by taxonomy with a command line parameter, and the taxonomy information is built into the database in a way that we can use it to limit your search. Um, it improves your performance. Oh, okay, and the other thing about Blast V version five is it improves your performance when limiting a BLAST search with accessions or retrieving by accession. And this is important as the NCBI moves from GIs, which are numbers, to accessions. Um, you can also retrieve sequences by taxonomy from the BLAST database. It works with the newest version of BLAST Plus, which was a um, made in an alpha release several months ago, but we're going to have a, an, an upcoming release and hopefully this month. Um, Peter did a webinar on this. Um, couple, actually several months ago, I guess. And so there's a YouTube link there. 
and then there's some documentation here that you can get to and since these slides are available you can get to those um, so moving on here um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Magic Blast. You know, it's a splice aware aligner. It's based on the um, the Magic on the aligner in the Magic Pipeline um, that Jean and Danielle Terry Meek had made, um, and we've re-implemented that with the Blast Toolkit. It uses Blast databases to do its mapping. It's um, especially good with longer sequences. And so this is a, and we have an article actually in, um, or, or we have a, a preprint, I guess you call it, in BioArchive, and that we'll be submitting to a journal soon. But so this is a figure from that um, preprint, and so this is a um, a set that we made up. It's the that the reads are based on the RESTIC annotation. And so that we actually know what the results really should be like. And, and Magic Blast was not used in the rest of the annotation, so there's, it's not a circular logic here. But you can see that with um, Magic Blast for these longer sequences, we do pretty well. Perfect matches is you know 97.2 percent, and some partial and some misaligned. And so we compare it against High Set 2 with some relaxed parameters, High Set 2, Star Long, and the older Top Hat 2. Um, so real quick, because I think I've probably run out of my time, this is the BLAST web page. You know, you can see the URL at the top. You can download standalone BLAST here down at the bottom there. Um, and there's a, over here in the right corner, you can see where there's some help that you can get. And we also have an AMI in, um, you know, Amazon machine image at AWS that you can run, and you can get it from there. Um, so resources. Um, some of the resources for command line options. Um, and these are actually the appendices in the BLAST manual. And so this is a several tables of the command line options. You can go and look at them. Um, and the re there's another appendix about reward and mismatch penalties. And this applies for BLAST N and MegaBlast. Available scoring matrices, and this is more BLAST P, um, BLAST X. And then there's a link to the, um, the Magic BLAST article preprint. Okay, and so I guess this is the, um, so after this is a few more slides that we're not going to go into. That's an appendix. I call it the hidden life of the BLAST database, and we just didn't have time for that. But if you want to take a look at it, then you're welcome to it. So. Okay, this is Peter Cooper again. Um, we have a lot of questions, more than I think I've ever seen in a webinar before, to be honest with you, which is good. Um, many of these are sort of detailed questions about how do I do a particular task. Um, I think it's, I can't even answer those right now because I have to go look at certain things and give you the correct, you know, exact entry queries and things like that. So for those things, um, I've answered some of them in the chat, but I haven't been able to answer all of them. I will make a document with the answers to those. So I'll post that and pass it off to everybody. The one thing that's come up several times because I think it was sort of announced ahead of time that um, Tom might be able to discuss this a little more was the max target sequence um, letter that was in bioinformatics. I guess that's where it was. Yeah. Yeah. So there's been a lot of confusion about that. And I guess what uh, there's several questions in the chat pod about that. And I guess what people want to know is what is the effect of max target sequences and what's the recommendation for how they should use that parameter? And, and how does it affect what results they see back? In other words, it's clear from reading the questions that many people believe that it shows you the first match it finds rather than the best one, which I don't think is true. Um, but I'll let you address that, if you don't mind. Okay, thanks, Peter. So, yeah, so BLAST goes through the, um, goes through the database looking for the best matches, collects those, and then presents them to you. And, and I kind of... Um, can I go back? Uh, go back here. So, and this is, um, and I was starting to address it here, limiting output to one match. So, so what Blast does is it goes through your database, finds the best matches, um, ranks them by score and expect value, and so in this case, in the bottom set, there's you know five matches that are basically equivalent, and Blast can't say that one is better than the other. Um, so it does show you the user, the um, if you just say, I want to see one, it shows you the top one. Um, so 
and now even if you say I only want to see one, Blast is still going to go through the entire database. It's still going to collect these five matches. Um, it actually collects a few more matches than it, you know, actually many more matches than it presents to you because, and this is just part of the algorithm to make sure that we don't miss stuff or to make it very unlikely we miss stuff. Um, so the, there had been the question max target sequences one, and you know when I think about it, I would you know generally recommend that you yeah you probably want to look at more than one sequence. Um, again, it depends on your use case. Um, in this case, I had ten, and I saw a bunch that were the same. So maybe if you don't want to look at a lot, then ten is a is a good number. Um, I would probably shy away from one unless you have the case like that any hit at all is going to that you want to that you're only interested if there's any match at all and so something that comes to my mind and maybe people have other examples would be is, is um, say I've sequenced some done some bacterial sequencing I know that the results should be bacterial but they've been done by humans and I want to make sure that there's no human DNA involved in there that I didn't somehow contaminate it with my own DNA so I take my sequences and I run them against the human database and any match then is going to be disqualifying for this read and I'm going to, you know, for this query and I'm just going to throw it away because it's contamination. So, so that's an example, I think, where maybe max target sequences one would be okay, but generally I think you want to go through several. Um, and like Peter said, is that there is some confusion about how BLAST, you know, BLAST is, goes through the database. Um, it does go through all the database, collects all the matches. Um, there is a example that you could, um, you know, and, and in this letter that he mentioned there, there wasn't the example that I really wanted to see, and I, I kind of need to see command line parameters and, and such. But you could imagine that I take all the sequences in the database, I reorder them, and maybe Blast would give me a different um, top match. And maybe instead of if I were to take my database and reorder it, maybe I'd get the second match here instead of the first one. So it's it's the same. You know, it's the same significance, um, and, and and Blast does have some tie-breaking logic in it to um, help people. That's kind of getting into technical details again, really go to right now. So I, you know, so that's basically my point of view is when I think about it, and I and I hadn't really thought about it until like the last week is, is you know, max target sequences one is is generally speaking not a great choice. Okay, thanks, Tom. Would you put that last slide back up? No, yeah. Just because. Oh, the la the last yeah, yeah, the last slide that was in the deck because basically we're out of time and I, I, there are lots of good questions in here. And I just want to point out that um, on the last slide, there are some um, useful links. The you know People are asking me stuff about command line parameters and things like that. Those things are addressed in the manual and in the help docs a lot of times. So take a look there. Uh, and if you ever have a question, like many of the questions that came in in the chat pod, Write to Blast Help. Blast Help is an email address that's on this slide here, blast help at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, and we will answer your question. Um, I just couldn't get to all the ones that we got in the chat pod, in the questions pod today, but I will put those in a document and I will make them available and I'll send you a link to it as soon as I have it ready. So I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, it's about quarter to one, which is what we said this was a 45 minute webinar. So we're going to stop there, and thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time.